Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Good Friday service here at Balhelvy Church. We're going to begin tonight in the words of one of the great Easter hymns. There is a green hill far away. Let's worship God together. Let's come before God in prayer now. Let us pray together. God of the green hill, God of city walls, God of temple court and country lane, God of hill and valley, desert and shoreline, plowed field and wilderness. God of time and space, God of turning galaxies, burning stars, dying suns. The world should sit at your feet this evening. Lights should be dimmed, curtains drawn, voices stilled in readiness for this remembrance. For what we remember this night is that when you came into the world, the world did not receive you. When you took a face and lived among us, the world did not recognize you. You came to offer life, but we sentenced you to death. For the life you offer means death to our pretense to be our own gods. And that is something we won't take from anyone. And so tonight, this part of the story comes to a head. The Hosannas of Palm Sunday have long faded away. Judas's plan gathers momentum and he leaves the table to be about his business. The disciples nod off as your soul groans in Gethsemane. Peter draws his sword to defend you, and in the next moment, he denies you three times. Just a few will remain with you to the bitter end. 
And yet with your dying breath, flecked with bloody spittle and spoken through broken teeth, love crucified, prayed, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. Words spoken not only over your killers, but over the whole human family. Lights should be dimmed, curtains drawn, voices stilled. In readiness for this awesome, awful revelation of the depths of human sin and the limitless horizon of your redeeming love. Father, forgive us, for we don't know what we are doing. Lord, may we recognize ourselves and recognize you in what we hear this evening and take our place among those who, having understood what happened at Calvary so long ago, take up our own crosses and follow in Christ's way. So hear our prayers because we ask them all in Christ's name, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our reading this evening is taken from John's Gospel, John chapter 12, and reading verses 20 to 33. Now, there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the feast. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honour the one who serves me. Now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, This voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. But I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. Most of the world walked right on past as Jesus was crucified. A few stragglers came to watch, some to weep and some to gloat. But with the blood still fresh on the cobbled streets of Jerusalem, most just turned back to whatever it was that their day held and got on with it, shaking their heads as they went on their way. Shaking their heads because they'd seen it all before. They knew that the powers that be will always crush people. People who stand up and raise their voices, who don't toe the line and play by the rules. Whatever you made of him, that Jesus character stood up to 
all the powers to Rome and the religious authorities, to money and to status, and it took an unholy alliance of all of them to actually bring him down. And if they think of him at all, the people around us in our day and age on Good Friday, I guess that's what a lot of folk make of Jesus. Just another good guy killed by the system. File him in the same file as Socrates, Lincoln, Gandhi, and Luther King. Good men who tried to stand for something and who came to a bad end. But if you spend any time with Jesus as we read about him in the Gospels, you soon discover that he's no passive victim when it comes to his dying. His death is something he chooses, not simply something that is imposed upon him. Throughout John's Gospel, we keep hearing that Jesus' time hasn't yet come. That's what he tells his mother when she urges him to intervene in the wine crisis at the wedding at Cana. That's what he tells his brothers when they urge him to go public in Jerusalem and start riding the waves of public acclaim that are beginning to swell underneath him. No, he says, my time has not yet come. And as the story plays out, my time gets more precise. It becomes my hour. There's a focus to it. He knows that something big is ahead of him, something crucial that his whole life is tending towards. But what is it? Well, he begins to make it clear in John chapter 12, which is the pivotal point of the whole gospel. John tells us that word of what Jesus has been doing has spread far beyond Israel, and at this great feast, the Passover, the non-Jews are wanting to meet him and find out more about who he is, and somehow that report that comes back to Jesus is the trigger, and he says, the hour has now come, and it's the hour for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now, if we're biblically literate, we know a bit about glory. Glory is bright, holy, shining cloud and fire. The Shekinah glory, as it was called in the Old Testament, that came with the divine presence as the people of Israel tabernacled in the desert and the same Shekinah glory that so filled Solomon's temple at its dedication that the priests literally couldn't go about their duties because of the sheer weight of the glory of God's presence. We know a bit about glory. We've heard it described. And even though the Godhead is veiled in flesh in Christ, that very same glory has already been seen in him. John tells us that when Jesus did turn the water into wine at Cana, his disciples saw his glory and they put their faith in him. He fed thousands from virtually nothing. He tied the very best scholars of the day up in their own words. He did healing signs, the like of which no one had ever seen before. And he even raised his friend Lazarus from the dead. So it's no wonder that the crowds lined the street on Palm Sunday as he entered Jerusalem. They'd heard rumors of glory and they were keen to see some of it for themselves. But none of them anticipated what was coming next. The strange kind of glory that was going to become the crux of Jesus' life. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified, he said. But then he tells us what his glorification is going to look like. And it looks like death. I tell you the truth. 
unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Jesus' glorification is going to come through his death. The death he accepts led like a lamb to the slaughter so that through him humankind could be restored to friendship and fellowship with God once more. And all that separates us from him could be dealt with, done away with. Gethsemane isn't mentioned by name in John's gospel, but you can hear Gethsemane plainly in these words from John 12. Jesus is praying, and he says, Now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Nobody saw this coming. This is not what glory is supposed to look like. Glory looks like triumph and power and strength and shining. Nobody even for a minute entertained the possibility that victory Glory might come through selflessness, faithfulness, and vulnerability. And yet, I would want to argue on this Good Friday that in going to the lengths God went to, to save and redeem His people, He's shown us more of His heart on the cross than He ever could by any display of His power. cross is his glory. And as I reflected on that uh, over the last few days, a parable began to form in my mind. And I hope that it goes uh, a little way towards explaining how the cross of Jesus can also be his glorification. There's a story told about a king who ruled his kingdom very well. He was wise and he judged fairly. He exercised his power for good and he was known to be generous and kind. And his subjects admired and revered him and they were glad that he was their ruler and no one else. But such was his standing and the greatness of his person that they dared not look him in the face. In private and in public, they kept their eyes lowered so that they would never meet his gaze. The king held a weekly court where anyone in the kingdom, the greatest to the least, could bring their requests to him and get a hearing. And the petitioners would gather nervously in an anteroom, and before they were taken into the royal presence together, there was a custom that each person should have their feet washed, it was felt to be an appropriate thing to do before you came into the king's presence. And so a kindly servant would appear with a basin and warm water and plenty of towels, and he would work his way around the room, smiling and talking to the supplicants as he washed their feet, getting to know their names and their stories, where they were from, what they were here for and he would advise them on how to best present their case to the king when their time came. And all the while, although they only realized that afterwards, he was putting them at ease for what was to come. And when everyone was ready, the servant would bid them farewell and leave. And within a few minutes, another servant would come and lead the petitioners into the king's presence, where they would lie prostrate on the floor until they were summoned to stand and voice their concerns, surrendering themselves to the king's wise judgment. And so it went on for many years. 
Those who found themselves coming back were always glad to see the kindly servant. Somehow he took away the fear that they felt of the prospect of entering the king's presence. And it meant a lot to them that he had remembered their names and their faces and their stories, even when they hadn't visited the palace for many years. One day, though, tragedy struck. Disguised as petitioners, two of the king's enemies managed to gain access to the anteroom. They drew out hidden daggers from the folds of their clothing and threatened to kill every last man, woman, and child in the palace if the servant didn't lead them to the king's private chambers. The servant bravely refused. A scuffle ensued, and although the intruders were overpowered, the kindly servant took a fatal wound to the side and bled to death right there on the anteroom floor. The supplicants raised the alarm and soldiers came running from the palace garrison with the king's high minister hot on their heels. Coming into the room and surveying the scene, he looked around and said, the king is dead. How? said the supplicants. Did others find him in his chambers? No, you fools, he said, kneeling by the body of the kindly servant. This man is your king. And his word filtered out from the palace. And the people heard what had happened. They were both saddened and amazed. The one who reigned over them had humbled himself enough to wash their feet and learn their names and hear their stories. They had always honored and respected him as their king. But now, seeing what had always been in his heart, they loved and they glorified him all the more because he was their brother and he was their friend. The cross is Christ's glory and the Father's glory because of the vast self-emptying love that we see there. The love of one who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. At the cross, we realize that the God who made the universe, who rules on high, loves us to the bitter end and cares for us enough to give his own life for us. If you know your Bible well, you might remember what the crowd said as they saw Jesus weeping at the tomb of his friend Lazarus. They said, see how he loved him. See how he loved him. As we lift our eyes to the crucified form of Christ, held there not by nails but by love, held there not to save us from the Father's wrath, but to show us the extent of the Father's love, there is one thing for us left to say in the face of such wondrous, strange glory. See how he loved us. Amen.
going to worship God together as we sing the words of When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Let us pray. We praise you, God, for the proof of your love and the revelation of your glory and the putting right of all that is wrong, that is the cross of Jesus Christ. We praise you that through his self-offering and death, you have reconciled us to yourself. And so with Jesus, we can say with confidence, Father, into your hands we commend our spirits. May our lives become a sharing in your glory 
Not only the shining glory of light and joy when all is well, but the strange glory that shines in the dark places, places like sacrifice chosen, costly identification, and self-giving love, the strange glory of your cross and ours. Lord, tonight we remember those living in the darkness and despair of pain and sorrow. Those bearing shame and scorn that they should never have had to bear. We lift up all who are mourning the passing of a loved one or having to stand by helpless as they watch them suffer. And we remember all who feel like hope has deserted them in these days, who are struggling to see beyond the bleak horizon of all that this time of pandemic has brought upon us. We lift them now into your healing and sustaining light in a moment of silence. Lord, into your hands we place our worries and concerns, our hopes and our longings. We place our very spirits. For to who else shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Lord, help us to hear the strains of those words through all the tumult and the strife of living. And help us fix our eyes on you, our crucified Lord and our risen Saviour, glorious in your revelation of the Father's love for the world. Amen. Our final hymn this evening is called Amazing Love. Son of God, give 
shall flow like rivers. Come wash, wash your guilt away. Christ, to remember his cross, to shoulder your own, and to share in his glory. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forevermore. Amen.